Today, we're traveling east on New York's Gold Coast to a land where vineyards meet the Atlantic Ocean and where you'll find some of the best beer anywhere around. Plus, the art of craft barrel making. Don't miss a refreshing moment of brewed in New York, Long Island. Discover even more local foods and beverages at Taste New York locations throughout the state. Whether you're at a state park, sporting event, or stopping at one of our New York welcome centers, it's never been easier to choose local and buy New York. Unilam, a family-owned business in upstate New York serving the building industry for over a century. You can spot Unilam's finely crafted timber products in breweries throughout New York State and beyond. Learn more at Unilam.com. 1886 Malt House. Proudly partnering with New York's finest grain growers to produce locally sourced, high-quality malt for farm and craft breweries. The Northeast Hop Alliance. Farmers, brewers, and educators working together to provide high quality, locally grown hops to craft beer consumers in New York and the Northeast. Long Island. The novelist Susan Jenkins said there are 10,000 different worlds between Great Neck and Montauk. Perhaps that's why this land has inspired so many different writers, poets, and artists. F. Scott Fitzgerald based his most famous novel, The Great Gatsby, on the lives of rich socialites living along the North Shore. When Jack Kerouac hit the road here, he was drawn to bars populated with fishermen from the public docks. And Walt Whitman spent many of his formative years here, surrounded by the rugged, natural beauty that would later inspire some of his poetry. From Fire Island and Jones Beach to the Hamptons, Long Island truly has something for everyone. And if you're as passionate as we are about good beer, then you won't be able to resist its charms. Where are we going to start, Maya? Well, Matt, I decided to visit the historic North Fork and the seaside town of Greenport. And I can't wait to tell you about it. When you travel almost three hours east of New York City to get to the end of Long Island, it's hard to believe you're still in New York State. And the North Fork certainly has a landscape and culture uniquely its own. Unlike the Hamptons to the south, this quaint area is known for its uncrowded beaches, farm stands, and over 40 wineries. There's a historic maritime feeling to the villages here. The town of Greenport was once a major whaling hub and the oyster harvesting capital of New York State. So when two lifelong friends decided to open their brewery here, naturally they made it a point to celebrate the town's harbor heritage. Back when Greenport Harbor co-founders John Leggy and Rich Vandenberg were in college, they used to talk about opening a brewery one day. But it was only a dream for nearly 25 years until an old firehouse in Greenport went up for sale in 2008. The opportunity proved irresistible. In 2012, they expanded to a second location seven miles away in the town of Peconic that dwarfs the original brewery. I wanted to know about their formula for success in a region no more for wine than beer. Tell me, how did you pick this specific location? We kind of call it an oasis amongst all the vineyards uh, for good beer. I think the work ethic out here is really strong. I mean, they're farm people and they're sea people, fishermen, long line fishermen still leave Greenport. And I think them seeing us and how focused we were on what we wanted to do, we did 95% of the work on original brewery ourselves. You know, they share that same kind of ethic. You have two different locations. Is there a difference between the two locations? The original brewery is right in downtown Greenport. It was an old firehouse that we renovated. So you get a lot more walk-up traffic. Uh, this was an old car dealership that we renovated. Uh, Love repurposing an old space like that. Now here, we're more surrounded by the vineyards. Mm -hmm. So 
It is almost two different type of demographics of people that come to visit us. Yeah. The original location is kind of the heart of the brewery. It's very small. We outgrew that in two years, and we always kind of intended that that would be the test kitchen, if you will, for Greenport. So that is what that brewery has become, and this brewery is you know, more the home base, but this is our larger location here. You mentioned that it was an old firehouse. I saw a gorgeous fire truck. It looked like there was tap handles in it. We retrofitted it where we uh, six tap handles on the side. You know, you have the eight-year-old kids that are, Dad, that's a cool fire truck. But then you have the 40-year-old fireman like, oh my gosh, that's the coolest fire truck I've ever seen. I'd love to know about this oyster festival that you two host. Every year we, uh, we host it in Greenport on the Sunday of Columbus Day weekend. And it's at the original brewery. It is our one festival there that we really focus on and it's home and it just feels great being there because you know most of our time now is spent at the second location. It is just uh, really getting back to the heart of, the, of that original brewery and working with people that are super connected to you know, the oyster farms on the east end of Long Island. We'll bring in eight or 10 growers uh, that are all regional to the area. We had like uh, this great two local musicians that play these sea shanties. We brought the fire truck down and served mm -hmm. beer off the fire truck. So, you know, it's not necessarily the kind of oyster festival that you have tens of thousands of people at, but it's really such an authentic kind of intimate village setting for us that it's actually really cool. In fact, John and Rich love the oyster harvesting legacy of Greenport so much that they even found a way to celebrate it that might surprise you. I have never heard of an oyster beer before. Is that something new to just specifically you all, or is this an old recipe? I think it's more of a harbor uh, kind of style. There were over two dozen oyster factories back in the early 1800s. It was at one point the capital oyster industry out here in Greenport. So uh, it just seemed like a real natural fit. And then the aquaculture industry has really rebounded tremendously and we're very supportive of that. Uh, great symbiotic relationship with the waters and the bays and our brewery. If you think an oyster-inspired beer sounds a little fishy, it did to me too. So to understand it better, I sat down for a little tasting with head brewer Patrick Alfred. Now tell me about this oyster beer. I, I have never heard of this in my life before. Hidden Pearl is our oyster stout. Basically, we take our traditional dry Irish stout, slightly roasty, a little bit of chocolate malt, um, keep the gravity low, so it's like a 5.8% alcohol, and then we shucked about three dozen oyster shells into the boil, um, where it sat for about 60 minutes of the duration, as well as um, some of the oyster liquid from the shell, but no actual oyster meat. I and mean, what that does is kind of lends like a nice, briny minerality, and not fishy at all. Where do you harvest these oysters? Little Creek oysters in Greenport. So really super local backyard oysters, and he said he picked them because of their brininess and what they can contribute to the beer overall. Now we are in wine country, so what is the advantage to being a brewer here? Do you get to use some of the ingredients? Absolutely. Yeah. Harvest started about, I think, two weeks ago, and it's still going for grapes. Um, we do a beer every year with, uh, in collaboration with a different winery called Cuvées On. And uh, we use either grapes or the juice or both. We interchange with a, a white or red each year, and I believe this year we're using a red grape. So definitely just tying into like locally produced, um, you know, any kind of ingredient that we can get our hands on. So it's not just oysters that make it into the beer, but all kinds of local products and flavors. And their commitment to local agriculture extends to the restaurant side of the business as well. We definitely utilize local, you know, as far as the, all of our produce is actually grown right across the street. Mm -hmm. And the seafood's pulled right from Greenport Harbor and local fish purveyors. What's it like being owners of a brewery? I think what's amazing about it is to be able to kind of interact with people that come in that are exploring beer, kind of learning about beer, not certain about whether or not they really like beer, and then being able to kind of watch their eyes open wide when they taste something that they really love and, and have that experience, and it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great place. I have one other question for you. What do you see next? Are you guys going to try to open another location? No. <laughs> okay. This is it. We're very happy to be in the space we are. And, making the amount of beer that we make and making the kinds of beer we make. So there are absolutely no like goals to go any bigger than what you see here. Hey, I think it sounds good. I mean, you got a good hand, you just gotta call it. John and Rich definitely drew a straight flush when they went all in at Greenport Harbor. Just like a game of poker, you need a bit of luck and skill to win. Except in this case, the winners are the people of Greenport and everyone who's had a chance to sample what this brewery has to offer. 
Long Island is home to many great artists. And if you want to see a perfect example, look no further than the label art for Greenport Harbor. East End artist Scott Bluedorn created a series of surreal ocean-inspired images for each one of Greenport's flagship beers. It's just one more way they celebrate the art of craft. Now, being a small craft brewer allows you the freedom to differentiate yourself in all kinds of ways, from the branding and packaging to the way the beer is made. Barrel aging, for example, allows a brewer to create really unique flavors, sometimes flavors that have never existed before. And some of this flavor comes directly from the individual barrel in which the beer is produced. So choosing the right one is important, and it's led many brewers to seek out the highest quality barrels they can find. And the demand for high quality barrels has helped bring an industry back to New York that had been gone for a long time. I'm Kelly Blazowski. I'm married to Joe Blazowski, and he and I together own Adirondack Barrel Cooperage here in Remsen, New York. Well, my husband and I came upon the fact that there was a gap in services for the craft beverage industry. You know, craft beverage producers were having a hard time finding barrels. In 2014, when we started looking into it, there were no barrel cooperages in the Northeast United States. Well, the thing that's driving this resurgence in barrel coopers and barrel coopering is the resurgence in craft brewing, distilling, and wineries. Our whole goal has been to focus on the smaller craft beverage producer. We'll produce one to 50 barrels and anything in between. When I got into this, I wanted to build a better barrel and we're building a very consistent, very high quality barrel. My background is in construction. I build things, I've always done that. And I've always tried to be as good as I can be and take it to a different level. We're just a small four man crew but I've got a great crew. They're all very good. We blend high-tech machinery with old world ways. We've had all this machinery custom built for us specifically. It's not easy to build barrels. There's a lot of process that goes into it. Firstly, machining the wood. We use a very high-tech process for that. We have a CNC stave joining machine that produces really good stave flanks. We use all 24 to 36 month air dried lumber. We don't do any kiln dried wood here. It sits out in the rain, the snow, it mellows the wood. We raise them up into skirts and we bend those barrels. We low temperature toast. We don't do any steam bending here. Uh, so that fire bending and that low temperature toasting adds another whole layer of complexity to the barrel as far as flavors go. There's no glue. Those hoops are the only thing that holds that barrel together. So during the heating process and then the pressing, we're marrying that wood together. We're smashing them joints together, creating a watertight joint. All our hoops are pressed the same, so our hoops aren't all over the place. If you look across the row of barrels, every hoop is pressed the same height, and those are the pressure points on that barrel. We've been in production uh, almost two years now, and I've not had not one barrel come back yet for a leak. And then we have a one-of-a-kind charring process that is very, very accurate. You know, I tell people that we use a dragon to char our barrels. We feed him, and then he chars our barrels. I can achieve certain flavors with certain temperatures and certain types of wood. Caramels, vanillins, uh, smoky and nutty, marshmallowy, bread. We can actually dial those temperatures in exact and reproduce that every time. Really the most exciting part has been just to serve a growing industry. You know, it's great people. They're very passionate about their craft, whether it's distilling or winemaking or, or brewing beer. You know, they often cite that they're really excited to be able to tout that they are going from grain to barrel to bottle uh, with a New York made product ingredients and process. Our production schedule it runs about 120 to 125 barrels a month right now. Soon to produce 200 within the next couple years. Big cooperages can produce up to 2,000 barrels a day. And I want to grow slow so that we can maintain the quality and consistency that we've set out to do. You know, we hope that we can change the way people look at their barrels. At one point, they were just a vessel. Now people are doing a lot more experimenting than what they used to. That's who we want to work with, is the progressive distiller, brewery, and winery that wants to do something different than what's been done for the last 
40, 50 years. So this is a whole new revolution and you know we're starting to make a really good name for ourselves. If you're planning on trying out beer tourism in New York, there are plenty of great public transportation options for your next brewery tour. Investigate and plan ahead so you can enjoy responsibly. Please remember, you should never drink and drive. Craft 101. Superman versus Batman. Coke versus Pepsi. Cats versus dogs. These epic rivalries have divided mankind for ages. The world of craft beer has a rivalry all its own. Cans versus bottles. From supermarket six packs to takeaway growlers and crowlers, there's no shortage of opinions on the battle over glass and aluminum. Let's take some time to talk about the pros and cons of each and maybe even settle this debate once and for all. For a long time, cans have suffered the stigma of being equated with mass market beers. So the craft beer industry differentiated its products with fancy glass bottles. Many old school craft beer drinkers will insist that a beer from a bottle just generally tastes better than from its aluminum counterpart, although there's little evidence to back this up. But lately, cans are steadily making their way into production lines and onto store shelves. So which is better? While some would argue that aesthetics or personal preference are reason enough to choose one over the other, there are actually some more technical considerations that guide the debate. At the top of that list is the preservation of the beer's flavor. Light, oxygen, and heat are the three biggest enemies to a great tasting beer. Keep these three things in check and your beer can stay as fresh as the day it left the brewery. Give them access and your beer can get a bit, uh, well, I, I think you can agree, no one likes a skunky beer. Amber shades of glass actually do a pretty good job at stopping most light exposure into bottles, but they can't offer the full protection from light that a can does. Also unlike bottles, cans offer a perfect airtight seal, keeping oxygen from getting into your beer and making it taste stale. Add to that the convenient mobility of cans that don't break when you throw them into the cooler for a day at the beach, and we can start to see why cans are making such a large comeback. But while cans do dominate in these areas, bottles still have some unique attributes. Belgian styles, for instance, undergo bottle fermentation. This involves adding a little extra yeast and sugar before the final corking. And because the seal isn't perfectly airtight, the bottle can accommodate this extra boost. Attempting to do the same in a can could cause it to explode, which, as you can guess, is generally not great for beer. So while cans can keep your favorite IPA a little more crisp than a bottle, those maltier Belgian styles you love so much wouldn't quite make it to your home without the classic glass bottle. In my opinion, cans just have an undeniable aesthetic. The labels look cooler, especially on a tall boy. So have we broken the stigma? It's cans, right? Well, for what it's worth, my money is on cans, but whatever mode of transportation you choose, as long as tasty craft beer has somehow made its way from the brewery to your mouth, there's really not much worth fighting about. Soup strainer. Caterpillar. Bromo. Do you know which brewery I'm speaking about yet? Mustache Brewing in Riverhead, Long Island may have unwittingly embedded a lesson in its kitschy name. Growing a handlebar mustache takes commitment and patience, and the same is true for launching a successful brewery. I am Matthew Spitz. I am one of the co-owners here at Mustache Brewing Company, along with my wife. I'm Lori Spitz. I'm the other co-owner, the non-mustache half of the brewery. Our mission is to make universally enjoyable beers for everyone. We have brown ales and porters and, and cream ales and pale ales, more of your traditional kind of craft beers, but we also do all these crazy IPAs and new and experimental things with hops and fruits and things. We can satisfy a lot of different levels of craft beer drinkers. Some of our signature beers are Milk and Honey Brown Ale, our Sailor Mouth IPA Lawn, which is a cream ale, Life of Leisure, which is our pale ale, Every Man's Porter, Wanderlust, ESB, which is uh, English style. In the tap room here, we try to really pull in the community space kind of feel. We have long tables that are communal tables. We invite people to bring children and dogs, and you can bring in outside food and just come and hang out if you want. We have people that come, they'll have work meetings here. You know, they'll just come here, grab a pint, stand around a table, and just discuss what they have to do. If people come and do homework, read books, it's great, I love it. Having that kind of space where people come and meet and have, have conversations and enjoy each other's company 
instead of being glued to the TV screen, it's a third space. So, yeah, it's exactly. not home or work, it's here. One of the things that's really important to us also is giving back to the community. So we do a bunch of different beers throughout the year where we donate a portion of the profits to cleaning up like the local water, educational scholarships. When we opened, we auctioned off the first pint ever poured in our tasting room for I think about $250. We donated the money to a local animal shelter. We have a captive audience, and when you have a captive audience, if you can do something good with that, that's important. So Matt and I went to high school together. I was one of the leads on stage crew. She was helping build a lamp post, I think, and, and, that's what I was and uh, she caught my eye. And, uh, and the rest is history. Yep. <laughs> Being married to your business partner, finding that, that work-life balance has been challenging. There's never the separation of work and life. Sometimes we have to designate, all right, we're not talking about work during dinner tonight. That's also one of the great things about being married to a business partner is the expedition of, of ideas and stuff. You don't have to wait until you go to work the next morning and write an email or whatever, like, oh, you just, it's just right here and it happens instantly. A lot more things happen faster that way. Homebrewing is what spurred opening the brewery for us. We had a friend who was a professional brewer. You know, we were at a bar one night and he's like, yeah, you can do this at home and brew on your stove. And we're like, really? We're like, all right, let's try it. So we bought all the ingredients and the next weekend, he came over, we brewed. A couple weeks later, we had our friends over. We drank it. Nobody got sick or died or went blind. So we did it again. And then probably, yeah, back in 2011, I would say, yeah, you know, 2010, 10, 2011, we got really serious into figuring out, all right, what does it really take to open a brewery? How can we feasibly really do this? We had a friend that had done a Kickstarter, and we're like, you know what, we'll just try this. We raised the money, great. If we don't, either maybe we weren't supposed to be doing this, or we just gotta find another way. And we raised over $31,000. She had a goal of $25,000. We were like, oh crap, we have to actually do this now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, uh, when we were, you know, time to come up with a name for our brewery, it just kind of fit. It was under my nose the whole time, you know? It was, uh, <laughs> when we started, it was her and I doing every single thing here. Yeah, I mean, we jackhammered out the floor for the, the drains. Apparently, yeah. they let you do that at the hardware store. They just let you leave with a jackhammer. And yeah. Just, good luck, guys. I was working you know, a full-time job still, and uh, so I'd, I'd get out of work, I'd come here, I'd brew a batch till four in the morning, and then go to work the next day. It was crazy. <laughs> I did and I still do everything on the back end. So I'm doing all of the logistical stuff, the paperwork, you know, I design almost pretty much all of our can labels, uh, all of our packaging, our social media, all of our marketing. We were very fortunate to find Rob, who is way smarter than I am um, and has a uh, similar level of OCD that I do. Working with Matt is absolutely terrible. Uh, <laughs> no. Working with Matt and Lori is great. They're very open to ideas. If I come up with something and I say, oh, I'd love to try this, they're for it. They're not going to shoot the idea down. And I think that that is one of the keys to our success is that it's so collaborative, even internally. Matt and I both have a lot of OCD. And I realized that really early on because he'd have certain things placed in a certain spot. And then I would say, oh, I like it placed here. And then things would kind of move back and forth. And then we kind of realize that we're just moving the same piece. It's worked out really well because it allows the brewery to be very clean, uniform, and everything has a purpose, everything has a spot. And uh, it's easy to find things when you really need them. We currently occupy a quarter of the space in this building. We just signed a lease to take over the rest of the building. So going from 1,400 square feet to 5,600 square feet. Right now our taste room is a flexible space where it's our loading dock as well and a staging area for kegs and so we can't be in production while we're open for tastings. Um, in the new spot, we'll have a complete separation so we can be brewing 24 hours a day if we really wanted to and not impact anything in the tasting room. That will also have extra space for more tanks and bigger brewing system and capacity. You know, we're not gonna max out our entire space right away. We'll definitely be able to grow into it as, as we need to. This expansion will be Expanding the mustache family as well. Uh, we'll be bringing on probably about like, 10 new employees. Independence is knowing where your beer is made, who's making it, and, and ultimately where the money is going after you purchase your beer. We're making our own decisions. 
product isn't being driven by marketing, it's being driven by what we think is best, what's right at the moment. It's not beer being marketed as craft beer, but really being produced by global conglomerate corporations. Aw, oh, Matt and Lori are a really cute couple. And like Matt's mustache, the brewery has grown a lot. So just in case it wasn't clear that the name was inspired by Matt Spitz's handlebar mustache, here's a picture from 2016. So maybe now they'll change the name to Bearded Brewery? I wouldn't bet on it. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us on Brewed in New York, Long Island. 